choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. But the stone was just the right size to put the giant on the ground. And the wave they don't sit so high, on the top of them are looking down. I soar with the wind of eagles when I stop and listen to the sound of Jesus singing over me. Let's stand and pass the peace of Jesus Christ to one another. You may be seated for just a moment here. Happy Easter to everyone. I'm Brian of the pastor here at Grace. We're so glad that you've joined us in worship today. Uh, we are uh, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. We've been going through the series on Luke. Uh, yesterday we had our egg hunt, which was a ton of fun. We had a huge amount of, of kids and, and the family was here. Here's an image from our Easter egg hunt. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I took this picture from the balcony. I actually, I noticed something a little unusual in this photo. If you can zoom in on that. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> That's about how our egg hunt went yesterday. It was glorious in all its chaos. Uh, we have a guest trumpeter here with us today, Lakey. We're glad to have you here with us. We also have flowers that are here in our altar space. They're dedicated to loved ones. We want you to uh, take a moment to uh, look at all the names and all the people those are dedicated to in the flower bulletin today. So we're grateful to all those that have purchased those and given uh, gifts to the church for that. You can take those home at the end of today's service uh, if you haven't chosen to donate those to the church here. Uh, and 
for those that are watching online. We're glad that you've joined us as well. Uh, thanks for joining us online. You can follow along with today's order of worship at gumc.org slash worship. All right, so I want to invite you, let's stand and join together in our call to worship. The tomb is dark but empty. The one you are looking for has overcome the darkness. The stone has been rolled away. The one you are looking for has overcome death. The burial clothes are put aside. The one you are looking for is alive. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let's sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. We repeat our shouts of praise and joy again and again because Jesus is victorious over sin and death. Jesus has risen in power and is restoring the whole world. Alleluia. Amen. Let us sing up from the grave he arose.
Amen. You may be seated. Just a few brief announcements for you as we continue in worship on this Easter morning. First, thank you to our volunteers that helped with the egg hunt and our Holy Thursday event. Uh, both of those were wonderful and well-received. And uh, we're going to have a volunteer breakfast on April 31st. So we want to thank all those who volunteered in those events, as well as events throughout the year. So we hope you'll join us for that April 21st breakfast, 9 a.m., an hour before worship. We'll eat breakfast together in Fellowship Hall and then join together for our worship service at 10 a.m. Uh, next week, we have the Reverend David Wiley preaching for us, so I hope you'll come and join us for that special event as he returns to, to join us in worship. And uh, one last thing, uh, we have our Christmas fair. It's coming up. It's right around the corner, folks. Uh, and uh, we have items to help out with our Christmas fair. The bulletin has been updated in the back if you can help out with that. As we get ready for that huge event for the church, uh, we'll have that in November. But we do want to uh, make sure folks are helping along the way to make sure we have everything we need for that event. So please do check that out in the narthex. Uh, before uh, at the end of today's worship service our choir is coming forward so in just a moment we'll be collecting the tithes and offering and we want to invite you to give generously to the work of the church and uh, if you could take a moment now please fill in the attendance pad on the outside of your pew if you could please uh, fill that in with your name and your address let us know that you're here in worship with us today and uh, as we collect the offering know that that goes to support all kinds of good things in the church from the egg hunt and the holy thursday service to have things like that happen to the missions work that we do uh, so many good things happen because you give generously to the church so we hope that you'll give today in support of all that good work as we share the good news of jesus christ with the world around us so now uh, i invite you let us uh uh, hear our offering song. The ushers will come forward to collect your tithes, and uh, let's hear them sing as we uh, give our gifts to the church today.
let's stand for the doxology. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this gift that is given. We thank you for the work that you do in our hearts and lives. We're grateful, Lord God, for the gifts that will go to change the world around us. God, thank you for each person that gives, and may they be blessed in their giving, Lord God. Now bless us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We have finally arrived at Easter. We've been on the journey of Lent, which is the six weeks leading up to Easter meant to prepare ourselves. Through it all, our focus has been on the Gospel of Luke and the ways Jesus ministered to outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. This theme kept coming up in story after story that God loves even those who the world rejects. It didn't matter if they were sinners, uh, saints, or like Peter, rejected Jesus right as he was put on trial for a crime he did not commit that would lead to his death by crucifixion. Over and over, Jesus is shown to be righteous, to be empathetic to those who are hurt, and to be far more than anyone could have hoped for in a Messiah a chosen one from God. Our scripture for today comes from the last chapter in Luke's gospel. Paul is going to read for us. Jesus was crucified. His body was taken down from the cross and laid in a brand new tomb in the middle of a garden. And we hear that the women who had followed Jesus for years at this point saw where this new tomb was, but because the Sabbath was about to begin, they waited to place the traditional aromatics that would cover the smell of a dead body. So Friday night turns into Saturday and Saturday to Sunday morning when they return to hear the greatest good news. This is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb Taking the spices they had prepared, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. They remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. And from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Let us pray. Lord, on this Easter day, fill our hearts with your good news of resurrection life. Make us like you this day and every day. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Growing up, I always had a, a dog in my house. In fact, at one point, our house felt very much like a zoo when my dad bought all of us kids hamsters on a Christmas. Uh, my mom always had a parakeet and a cat while my oldest brother had a turtle, so things were always a little wild growing up. But right around the time that I got married, all of those previous pets in my life paled in comparison to when I got my very own dog. Uh, my brother had this particular Cavalier King Charles Spaniel first. He actually got him from my sister-in-law, who when she got pregnant, was worried how having a dog and a baby would go, so my brother adopted him. Then his wife got pregnant, and he decided to pass along little Teddy to us. I love that little guy. When my wife got pregnant, we decided that Teddy was officially the baby fairy, but that we would not be passing him along to anyone else. He had had enough homes for a lifetime, and he was ours to keep. He was great with the baby, too, and our son, Davey, got, as he got older, he learned to love that dog as well. Uh, we have plenty of embarrassing photos of the dog and the baby in the bathtub together. Uh, you'll have to forgive me for not sharing those with you today. Uh, I'm saving those for when Davey graduates from high school. <laughs> Sadly, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are often born with a heart defect. When we noticed a problem with Teddy, we brought him to the vet and got his prescription. It did not take long, though, for the problem to go from bad to worse. Within just a few short weeks, it was clear Teddy was going to die. I remember the last day when I came home from work, I went upstairs to get changed like I always do, and Teddy followed me. It was strange because he had not gone up those stairs for several days. He was too sick. After I finished, I picked him up, and as I carried him back down the stairs, he died in my arms. The next day seemed like it was straight out of a movie. I dug a hole in the backyard to bury my dog, and as I did, it started raining so hard. It almost felt like God was weeping with me over the death of that tiny creature. We had the world's cutest funeral with our children and some of their friends coming to say goodbye. They shared their memories and threw some treats into the grave. But to me, the world just did not look the same without Teddy in it. If there is one reality that all people will come to know, it's that death is a hard thing to handle. Whether it's a pet, a family member, or a friend, we will all have to deal with it eventually, and it can be so so difficult. I spent time with our homebound folks here in the church, and one recurring theme I've heard over the years is one of the challenges that often goes unnoticed at that stage. When you sit and talk with these folks, they say things like, I have outlived every single person I ever knew. We don't think about that much, do we? Imagine a world where every single person you grew up with you lived life with, you got to know and loved, is simply gone. It is a sad, cold reality. Philosophers have tried for centuries to bring meaning to death's harsh reality. Some say life is only a shadow and our body is a chain for the soul. So when we die, they would tell you not to mourn because the real part of you is finally going to be set free. Others say death can help bring direction to our lives. I think of the people who have had near-death experiences, and when they come back, they suddenly have a clarity and purpose in life that simply did not exist previous to that. My own father had a near-death experience, and he was definitely a different man after a near-fatal heart attack. If we didn't have death in our future, the philosophers would say our lives would lose their meaning. Uh, the skeptics and atheists take another tact. Uh, maybe we have a few here with us today, and we're glad that you're here. You are always welcome. Uh, I've heard atheists joke around Easter, though, that Christians are celebrating a zombie. 
A dead man raised back to life? That's literally the definition of a zombie, isn't it? And I think that's very clever. Well done, atheists. Very funny. But when you look more closely at the story, we find there is nothing dead about Jesus at all. He brings a completely different meaning and purpose to death from all of the other philosophies that are out there. As we've been following the Gospel of Luke over a month, uh, we can see some trends emerging. When Jesus was arrested and beaten by the religious leaders, it was a dark moment. His best friend Peter wouldn't stand up for him and denied him three times before the rooster crowed. Peter knew he was wrong, even though he was a faithful follower and exactly the kind of person that should have trusted Jesus, even when things were at their toughest. But he denies him. You know who does accept Jesus, though? The criminal on the cross. He really doesn't have any reason to trust Jesus, especially since he's dying right there next to him. But this man who has committed crimes and played the role of the villain is now being executed and chooses that moment to accept Jesus. And Jesus' words to him are, Today you will be with me in paradise. There's this term that shows up for Jesus over and over throughout the scriptures. He's called the firstborn. Now, he is a firstborn child, but the point is far bigger. When the word is used about Jesus, the writers mean he is of the highest rank. The criminal on the cross is acknowledging this in his final moments of life on earth. Jesus is first, and he wants to be counted among his followers. It wasn't only Peter that denied Jesus, though. When Jesus was arrested, all of the disciples ran away. The only people that stuck around were the women. They had supported Jesus' ministry when he traveled, providing food and shelter. They donated money so that he could travel. They listened to his teachings at his feet, anointed him, and when he was put on trial, they were the ones who followed him along the street and stayed near as he was crucified. It was the women who brought the mixtures to his grave. It was they who heard the good news first, that Jesus was no longer dead. That's when the angel asks them a poignant question, why do you look for the living among the dead? As the women share this news with the other disciples, they declare, like the criminal on the cross, Jesus is firstborn. He is the one to be honored with our whole lives. The men, they show their ignorance as they think they know, uh, they, they, they don't really understand what they're saying. They call it an idle tale. The word translates as pure nonsense, delirium, trash. The men don't believe the women, partly because women were second-class citizens back then, and it was easier to dismiss them than to deal with the facts, but also because they were convinced that Jesus really was dead. They knew he was crucified, and the Romans never made a mistake killing people in such a brutal way. Maybe you know someone who is dead. Sure, they might be physically alive, but they are dead inside. Scripture talks about dead wombs that can never bring life and dead hearts that can never believe or love again. Do you know people like that? Have you ever felt like that yourself? That's what the disciples thought of Jesus. Well, there are some women that want to tell us today that the dead can live again. Jesus is the firstborn, the first to live even after death has entered the picture. The angels remind the women who tell the other disciples who go on to share this message with the whole world that we should not look for the living among the dead. When we pursue our own way, our own desires, we are like people that are dead inside. We are looking for life among the dead. When we pursue war like we see in some parts of the world, we are looking for life among the dead. When we have hatred and bias toward others or minimizing groups of people like Jesus' disciples did to these women, we are looking for life among the dead. This is not the call of God on our lives. We will not find Jesus when we pursue these dead ends. God has always desired for us to find the fullness of life. 
the writer C.S. Lewis tells us, when one's relationship to God is given first place, everything else, including our earthly loves and pleasures, increase. When Christ is put first in our lives, all secondary things are not suppressed, they are paradoxically increase and grow. God doesn't tell us to pursue Jesus because he wants to squash all other desires. He does it because it is through Jesus that we can finally give up pursuing dead things that only lead to dead ends in our lives. It is Jesus, who is the firstborn, uh, that tells us what life really means. It's not refocusing our lives uh, before death or releasing our tortured souls. Death is a means to life, raised with Jesus for all eternity. Now, that doesn't mean our life here on earth doesn't matter. It means when we get our priorities straight, we can see that everything is filled with life. There was a, a mother who joined a church the Sunday before Easter. She showed up early and met another person who was also joining the church for the first time. And this person asked her how she was doing, and everything just spilled out of her. She was doing awful. She had spent the last two days in the hospital. Her eight-year-old son had just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The doctor said they would not let her son leave the hospital until both parents knew how to properly give insulin shots that would help keep him alive. Her husband had tried doing the shot and had no problem. Then she took her turn and had completely failed. She hit a muscle and then pulled the needle out, so she had to do it all over again and somehow managed to do it even worse the second time. Her son was hurt and didn't want her to come near him again. Her heart spilled out to this, this other person in the church, a near stranger, and you know what he said? He said, I have type 1 diabetes too. Maybe God sent me here to help you and your son. When you pursue God, life springs forth. Later that day, her son was released from the hospital, not because she had learned to give him the insulin, but because her own 8-year-old child had taken matters into his own hands and decided he didn't want to be de in, uh, dependent on anyone else. He was going to do this thing for himself. Life springs forth again. When you put God first, it's not that your family or friends are less important, or that your job doesn't matter. It means you are going to find real life with Jesus. That's what the crucified and resurrected life looks like. It is real life found in Jesus when we put him in first place. The criminal on the cross put Jesus first, as did the women who came to the tomb. When Peter rushed to see what was in the tomb, he was awestruck. In resurrection, life springs forth. This Easter, may you put Christ first in your life, and as you do, may you find the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. As this time in response to this word that we've just heard, we are going to have a baptismal renewal. Uh, everyone who's been baptized, we invite you to come forward and to have your baptism renewed. Uh, if you have not been baptized, maybe today's the day. Let me know if you'd like to be baptized here with us today. So uh, we're going to uh, go through our liturgy, and then the ushers are going to direct you to come forward. And uh, we have uh, palm branches here, and so we'll, we'll renew your baptism one at a time as you come through to this space. So uh, let's begin together in our baptism liturgy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. 
through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledging what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nation, uh, ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? If so, say, I believe in God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. You brought their children through the Jordan River to the land you promised them. And in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. When he was baptized by John, anointed by your spirit, he called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water that we would remember the grace declared at our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. Amen. As the ushers direct you, I invite you to come forward and to have your baptism renewed with us today.
Praise God. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious and patient God, we come before you with so many things which weigh us down. We would like an easy faith, one that doesn't cause us to look within ourselves to identify those many ways in which we have forsaken you. But faith is never easy. It requires our very souls. Forgive us, God, for all those things which we have neglected to do that would have helped someone else to be closer to you. Heal our hearts from the wounds which have been inflicted upon us by the anger and misunderstandings which occur in relationships. Prepare our lives to be of service to you. In the silence, Lord, we wait. We long for your presence and your healing touch. Oh God, we worship on this holy day knowing that we are your Easter people. We read the story again and marvel at the sight of the rising sun. It's as if we were people living on the poles of this earth who wonder at the glimpse of the light of the sun after a season of darkness. Memory recalls the return of light, yet we still marvel and wonder at its arrival. Help us, Lord, to reflect the light of your rising sun that others might see and give glory to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. We know that God is merciful, God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, so now feel the healing, loving power of God in your lives, for it is given to you through Jesus Christ. We pray for Jan as she recovers from pancreatitis, Carla Barron on the death of her five-year-old granddaughter. We pray for Jean Noah, and Lord, all those in need today, bless them and comfort them and help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ as we care for them and comfort them. And now we pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing one final song together here. Because he lives, let's sing together.
again, I want to invite you. We're going to sing the Alleluia Chorus, so remain standing for that. If you'd like to join our choir upstairs, you're welcome to do so. So go ahead and head up that way. And now, uh, and we'll also have our coffee hour in the back, so stick around for that if you'd like some coffee and some snacks. Now I invite you to receive the blessing. Because the tomb is empty, your life can be full. So go into every place and every day as people brimming with the love of God. Be graceful in spirit, hopeful in word, faithful in deed. Live for the risen Christ lives in you. Alleluia and amen. Go in peace and happy Easter. Let's hear the hallelujah chorus now. <laughs>